What was meant by historians 1500 years ago when they wrote of kings and kingdoms? Today, most people around the world see the British Kingdom, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, as the Super Kingdom, its throne occupied by the Super Royals, its inheritance the natural order of things. This order is hardly questioned outside Britain, and not very much inside, now that Princess Diana's character is better known, and she becomes increasingly an historical figure. Even the outpouring of grief for her in 1997 was hardly about getting rid of the kingdom. For some, it was no more than jumping the succession to exclude Prince Charles. Although the worst opinion poll for him at that time was down to 64% in favour of his succeeding his mother. A rating that an incumbent prime minister or American president would give his right arm for. The word kingdom is used in several ways in the early Anglo-Saxon centuries. First, it is used of the Roman Empire as in, and Martianus and Valentinian succeeded to the kingdom, a line quoted from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in the last episode, is also used of Rome's successor state, the Eastern Empire, based on Constantinople from the 5th century. Finally, it is used of the Western or Holy Roman Empire, established by Charlemagne in 800 with its capital at Aachen, Western Germany. The three Roman empires have features we can recognise as being organised government. All were continuous until their fall. Their kings or emperors inherited with written law codes to which they added or wrote their own law codes as they liked. They ruled by writ or by writing. So there were bureaucracies of literate men to make imperial law effectual. Because law was written down, educated men knew what was lawful and what was not, and the elements would have reached all society. Indeed, the existence of established bureaucracies enabled government to function in those inevitable periods when a hopeless king inherited the throne. The gathering of taxes was a daily component of people's lives. The royal authority was transmitted by a clear descent either in a family or by marriage into a ruling family and exercised by what are sometimes called today apparatchiks, who had a vested interest in the continuity of their jobs and power, as such people still do. There were exceptions. An important one was Justinian, Emperor of the East at Constantinople in the 6th century. He reconquered much of Italy and North Africa, produced a law code, reformed his church, and is magnificently commemorated with his wife Theodora in two mosaic reliefs at Ravenna, his capital in Italy. In the West, there is Charlemagne himself, who created the Holy Roman Empire by continuing conquests begun by his father. He was the son of Pippin the Short, who had been mayor of the palace to the Merovingian kings of the Franks, later the French. For the previous century, the Merovingian family had feuded and the mayor of the palace became the power in the land. Charles Martel, whom we met in episode three, as the victor of Poitiers against the Muslims in 732, was mayor of the palace. He was not the king. His son, Pippin, deposed Childeric III, the last Merovingian king of the Franks. What Charlemagne's father Pippin lacked in family descent, he got from Rome when Pope Zacharias gave his blessing to regime change to employ the modern expression again. Ever practical, Rome supported the power on the ground and Pippin became king. All of these rulers were also protectors of and were protected by a Christian church one of whose tenets was Christ's exhortation to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, although the predicate and unto God that which is God's was usually forgotten in the dynastic cut and thrust of politics. Custom, respect 
and even tyranny tend to support religion, nothing much changes. For dynasties today, read political families and parties, media and banking empires, or the dynasties of stage and screen where aristocracies thrive and whose individual names easily drop off the tongue in our modern world. In the early centuries AD, emperors succeeded to great empires and cities and could mobilize money and labor to beautify them in brick and carved stone with fabulous interiors over many years. Charlemagne began at Aachen and we are left more than 1200 years later with the remains of the symbols of his power and magnificence. Display is a critical attribute of monarchy. Kingdom is also used indiscriminately in chronicles because it was not always easy to find the correct word for a warlord's sphere of authority. So when the Anglo-Saxon chronicle says that Hengist and Isk, his son, succeeded to the kingdom, it cannot mean that they succeeded to anything remotely as organized as the Roman Empire had been when Britannia was a province, or as organized as the Kingdom of Wessex had become by King Alfred the Great's death in 899. When the Romans left Britannia at the end of the 4th century, the remains of a tax system would have died instantly. The rule of written law would have atrophied over perhaps a longer period, and the better off Romano Britons would have fled or repaired to their villas to become the sitting ducks of warlords who led the conquest of the island at the edge of the world in the 5th century. Kingdom seems to have been a convenient term that everyone would have understood, and was probably applied to an area under the domination of a leader of a band of armed men, whose chief was usually referred to as a king. Similarly, princes of the Angle race are unlikely to have had the same meaning in the 5th century as at the end of the 9th, when the chronicle was begun, and when being of the blood had become legally relevant to the succession. Even before King Alfred's reign, male members of the king's family were called ethlings, what we might call royal highnesses, Literally, they were throne-worthy. Alfred himself was the youngest of King Ethelwulf's four sons, each of whom in order of seniority succeeded peacefully to Wessex. Royalty, in the sense of lawful descent, was well known and cherished among the pagan Germanic incomers of the 5th and 6th centuries, but leadership was also based on whether one was a successful warlord Within a chieftain's family, there would very likely have been a member or two who was ready to fill a vacancy or even to create one. As the chronicle William of Malmesbury puts it, sedition always has its adherents. The literature of the German Romantic movement from the 1780s harked back to this ancient past and was disseminated to all through Wagnerian opera. We also come across men described as kings of the Wicca people in Warwickshire and Worcestershire, of Lindsay in Lincolnshire, of Elmet in West Yorkshire. We shall meet Guthrum, King Alfred's mortal Viking enemy, who is called King, but it's hard to say whether he was a real king in a period when kingship was becoming more than merely a warlord. Perhaps another test of an established monarchy in these early centuries after Rome is from whom their kings were descended and whom they married. The first Christian king of Kent, Ethelbert, had married Bertha, daughter of the Christian king Charibert of the Franks. A power struggle in Wessex at the end of the 8th century obliged the future king Egbert to seek protection at Charlemagne's court in Germany, where he married the emperor's great niece Raedbra. Egbert eventually succeeded to Wessex in 802 and reigned until 839. In Blood Royal, Charles Mosley describes this king as ancestor of every royal and princely house in Europe. Surely, genealogy was the crucial element that made true kingship. Bede himself seems not always to be of one mind on whether an area was a kingdom or a province. He often speaks of his own kingdom of Northumbria as a province. The opening annals of the Winchester version of the Chronicle tell us other things about Britain at this time of flux. The Britons, under Vortigern, were experiencing challenges to their authority from the Picts of Caledonia, modern Scotland. Rome, the former imperial power, was unable to help him, and Vortigern turned to the Angles in southern Denmark for assistance. 
The last of the regular relief of Roman garrisons in Britain took place in about 381, and the chronicle suggests that a power vacuum was left behind. We do not know how far Vortigern's authority ran, but possibly as far south as Kent, because this is where Hengist and Horsa are said to have landed in 449. Remember, they had come at first to help the British king. There are likely to have been British leaders in other parts of the country, and Vortigern may have enjoyed a kind of overlordship of the former Roman province. At first, the Anglo-Saxons were helpful against the Picts, but they soon turned against their British hosts, describing them as worthless and the land as excellent. Reinforcements were sent for from Angelm, North Germany, and Vort Vortigern must have been overthrown in a battle at Aylesford, Kent, against the Anglo-Saxons, because Hengist and Isk succeeded to the kingdom after it. We know that Horsa was killed, but there is no mention of the death of Vortigern, who may also have died about the same time. Two years later, the Britons abandoned Kent after a battle at Crayford, where 4,000 were killed, and they withdrew to London. The story of the arrival of Hengist and Horsa in the Chronicle is thought to have been taken from Bede, who gives us the traditional displacement of the German settlers around England. These newcomers were from the three most formidable races of Germany, the Saxons, Angles and Jutes. From the Jutes are descended the people of Kent and the Isle of Wight and those of the province of the West Saxons opposite the Isle of Wight who are called Jutes to this day. From the Saxons, that is the country now known as the land of the Old Saxons, came the East, South and West Saxons. And from the Angles, that is the country known as Angulus, which lies between the provinces of the Jutes and the Saxons and is said to be unpopulated to this day, are descended the East and Middle Saxons, the Mercians, all of the Northumbrian stock, that is those people living north of the River Humber, and other English peoples. Their first chieftains are said to have been brothers Hengist and Horsa. The latter was subsequently killed in battle against the Britons and was buried in East Kent, where the monument bearing his name still stands. They were the sons of Whitgills, whose father was Witter, whose father was Wector, son of Woden, from whose stock sprang the royal house of many provinces. Although Bede's disposition of the invaders has been attacked over the years, it has proved very durable. There are many stories from the 5th and 6th centuries which speak of persistent invasions of England. Some tell how the invaders fell out and fought one another, and as late as the 8th century, Bede despairs that the kingdoms within England, particularly his own Northumbria, were never weaker than when one family member fought against another. A nation speaks one language, and we learn from the Peterborough manuscript of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that the languages of Britain were English, British, Welsh, Scottish, Pictish and book language. Book language meant Latin. Cornish or Welsh may also have been a spoken language. Since this list is taken from Bede, it seems likely that these languages were those commonly spoken in the different areas of Britain in the first quarter of the 8th century when he was writing. Perhaps English had become the prevailing spoken language in the lands of the Anglo-Saxons by the end of the 9th century, when the chronicle was begun. This theme continues in the next episode with the naming of England. Some of the symbols of nationhood that originated in our period and have been adapted into our modern age might be unexpected.